Okay, we're going to get started here. Um, welcome to our special online presentation of Way Beyond Seneca Falls, Women's Suffrage, an Unfinished Revolution, and the Power of Place in New York with Judith Wellman. My name is Jordan Jace, and I'm your host for today's presentation. I am the Education Coordinator for the New York State Archives Partnership Trust and the Director of the of ConsiderTheSourceNY.org, an educational program of the Archives Partnership Trust. Uh, if you are an educator and would like CTLE credit for attending this presentation, uh, you must complete the CTLE form by clicking on the link uh, that I will put in the chat box uh, once the presentation starts. You will receive a one-hour CTLE certificate from the New York State Museum within three to four weeks. We will have time at the end of the presentation for a Q&A session with our presenter. So please submit your questions using the Q&A button on your screen, and I will present the questions to Judith at the end of her presentation. I would like to welcome our speaker, Judith Wellman. Uh, Judith is Principal Investigator of Historical New York Research Associates and Professor Emerita, State University of New York at Oswego. Judith focuses on historic sites relating to women's rights, the Underground Railroad, and African-American life across New York State. She lives in a house with unruly gardens on the banks of a mill <laughs> pond in upstate New York. She views historical work relating to equal rights as a contribution to a future of mutual respect and justice for all people. Welcome, Judith. Thank you so much, Jordan. It's an honor to be here. And many thanks to the New York State Museum, the New York State Archives Partnership Trust, the Women's Rights Alliance of New York State for hosting a program on these amazing, remarkable, and wonderful stories and wonderful people wonderful places across New York State. I want to dedicate this to my great great Aunt Martha and to all the Aunt Marthas and Uncle Silas's known and unknown who never gave up in a fight for justice. I want also to dedicate it to all of you who are citizens, teachers, historians, museum people who ask, what does it mean to be a good citizen in a democracy? We are now facing the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. The American Association of State and Local History has suggested five themes to commemorate this event. One of them is unfinished revolutions. What do the ideals of the American Revolution mean to us now? Another one is the power of place. Third one, we the people. Who are we the people? How do we include all of us? A third, a fourth one is the American exper experiment, and finally, doing history. How does the movement for women's right to vote help us carry out those themes? We have struggled as Americans to implement ideals of equal rights for all people throughout our history. The Declaration of Independence, the preamble says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, I know these words are echoing in your own minds as I speak, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is the right to vote. The movement for voting rights for women in New York State and across the nation extended in a formal way from 1848 to 1920. It's part of that larger struggle. And as we look at it, we see several major themes. One is that the national movement was supported by grassroots local communities. It included all kinds of people. And it left us today evidence in historic sites that can help us understand the power and diversity of this story of women's right to vote. The suffrage story also reminds us that equal rights, including voting rights, remain elusive. They are today part of America's unfinished revolution. We still struggle to include people of different classes, races, genders, cultures. Most people know something about the country's first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. About 300 people attended that convention. Many of them, 100, 68 women and 32 men, signed the Declaration of Sentiments. It was patterned after the Declaration of Independence, but instead of saying all men are created equal, 
It said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And the demands at Seneca Falls for equality in politics, voting, jobs, law, religion, are all issues that we continue to struggle with today. The ninth resolution at Seneca Falls advocated women's suffrage, resolved that it is the duty of the women of this country to secure to themselves their sacred right to the elective franchise. Like supporters of equal rights today, the 300 people at Seneca Falls were of different classes, races, ethnic backgrounds. Most of the signers of the Declaration of Sentiments were European, Protestant, but they came from a variety of ethnic and geographic backgrounds, including English, Irish, Eastern New York, Dutch, English, Yankees, Pennsylvania, Maryland. No known Native Americans attended. Frederick Douglass was the only signer of the Declaration of Sentiments of African descent, but also we think many other Black people also attended, including Thomas James and Joshua Wright, both of whom were trustees of the Wesleyan Methodist Church, both of whom had escaped from slavery. And historic structures that relate to the Seneca Falls Convention embody these themes of equality and diversity. The Wesleyan Chapel itself was called a lighthouse of reform. It was a major underground railroad site. It had a hierarchy neither of power nor of color, said its attendees. The Farmington Quaker Meeting House, about 20 miles west of Seneca Falls, was an abolitionist and underground railroad and women's rights site. It represented women's rights, it represented rights for Native people, people of African descent, and women. People affiliated with this meeting house helped Elizabeth Cady Stanton organize the Seneca Falls Convention. And if we look at workplaces and homes of people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments, we can see a wide variety of class and racial diversity. The Seneca Falls Textile Mill hired people who signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Some of those who came were fairly wealthy, like Charles Hoskins. Others were just modest in occupation by Joshua Martin. Uh, Thomas James, the bottom right, was a person of color who had escaped from slavery and became a very wealthy barber in Seneca Falls. It would be 69 years after Seneca Falls before women could vote in New York State and 72 years before the U.S. recognized women's right to vote with the 19th Amendment. In those 72 years, New York State provided some of the most important national leaders for women's rights and women's suffrage. And I know that you all recognize many of them. Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. If we look at historic sites relating to those leaders, uh, some of you may or may not recognize that the first house um, on Section A belonged to Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Literally, the deed was in her name. B is Frederick Douglass's uh, site of his North Star publication. C belonged to Matilda Jocelyn Gage in Fayetteville. And D is Susan B. Anthony's house in Rochester. But there were millions of other people who worked all over New York State and the nation. What about them? Do they reinforce these themes of diversity and equal rights? And can we find historic sites to help tell their stories as well? To help us answer these questions, there are three main projects. All of them were developed to commemorate the 100th anniversary of New York State and suffrage or of the federal suffrage amendment in 1920. One of them is the National Votes for Women Trail online database. It was started by the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites. We urge you all to get online and take a look at it. It is a crowd-based database that now has more than 2,200 suffrage sites across the country. Um, and they were all found by local people and put here. And we invite you to explore more local sites in your own area and to add them to that database. The National Votes for Women Trail and the National Collaborative of Women's History Sites also cooperated with the William G. Pomeroy Foundation to uh, develop a series of historic markers. There are now 209 of these across the country. 
66 of them are in New York State, which has more than any other state in the country, of course. And the third project was a survey of historic sites relating to women's suffrage in central New York that was sponsored by the Ontario County Historical Society. There is a large overview or historic context statement, as well as descriptions of sites and a database of more than 200 sites that is now on the Ontario County Historical Society website. Public support was key to all of these projects, and you see here a variety of local historians, of public officials, of students. On the left, Letitia James, the New York State His Attorney General, spoke at the dedication of the Equal Rights um, Marker in Brooklyn, New York. We find people in historical societies and churches, a Preservation League has been involved, and all over the state at a grassroots level, upstate, downstate, rural, urban, men, women, black, white. Um, it's been a huge project that, have, that has involved hundreds of people. Three main themes emerge from these studies. One is women's suffrage would not have happened without persistence grassroots action. I hope I can convince you of that as we move along. Second one is suffragists reflected the immense diversity of New York State's population. And third, historic sites powerfully evoke these suffrage stories and help us tell the overall suffrage story in New York State. Persistent grassroots action was a key, and here are just some couple of pictures of people in marches and organizations. In 1894, here's an example, there were more than 600,000 signatures on petitions asking that women's suffrage be incorporated in the New York State Constitution. That's almost 10% of the whole population. 1916, more than a million women, about a tenth of the total population and far more um, population of women, signed petitions asking for voting rights in New York State. Suffragists reflected New York State's diversity. And here are some photos that show you visually the diversity. If we look at the number of clubs that were suffrage related in New York State, we can see that there were about there were more than 450 political equality clubs in the New York State Woman Suffrage Association, which was mostly white, Protestant, some Catholic, some Jewish. It was rural, it was urban. The Empire State Federation of Women's Clubs, which was a black club movement, had more than 100 local chapters in New York State. And historic sites can help tell us the stories of these suffrage movements. And here are some examples, and I'll give you just a, a quick um, a spoiler alert that there are only a small number of examples here that we have that are that we've discovered of the hundreds we know. So if your favorite site isn't here, that's why it's just simply a question of not being able to include them all. Let's take a look at the development in chronological terms of the suffrage movement in New York State. And we'll show you some examples of historic sites that illustrate each of those periods from the early years to the late 19th century, to the grassroots network that developed in the early 20th century, to huge new energies after 1908 with new people, younger women, new tactics. And finally, to the a period after 1915, when suffrage was both accepted and also um, limited. We have lots of childhood homes of suffrage leaders in New York State. Uh, the one, uh, one of these is Susan B. Anthony's childhood home in Battenkill. Another one is uh, the Johnstown Courthouse, which was such an important site for Elizabeth Cady Stanton in Johnstown. In Brockport, Fanny Barrier Williams grew up in this home. She moved to Chicago and became extremely important in the national women's suffrage movement. But she came back here to retire where she lived from 1926 until she died in 1944. Judge Elisha, Elisha Hurlbut is a name that you may not know, but he is so important in the early movement because he wrote a booklet called Essay on Human Rights in 1845 in which he argued in a knock your socks off essay that rights are human rights, laws should not be made for man or for woman, but for mankind. 
it's well worth looking at or having your students look at even today. In DePaulville in St. Lawrence County, six women sent a petition to the New York State Legislature in 1846, two years before the Women's Rights Convention at Seneca Falls, asking for equal civil and political rights with men. In Macedon, there's a beautiful academy building that had both met women or girls and boys as students, blacks and whites as students, many people who were associated with Seneca Falls and the signers of the Declaration of Sentiments either went there themselves, sent their children there, or spoke there, including Frederick Douglass. In Waterloo, New York, the site of Junius Monthly Meeting of Friends is the place where a group called the Congregational Friends, Quakers, met there in the, from 1848 until the 1880s, and they believed in equal rights for all people, and they worked for Native Americans, African Americans, women's rights. They became a prototype for one of the most interesting groups that emerged after the Civil War called the American Equal Rights Association, which again articulated a, a goal of equal rights for all people. Amy Post was one of those people. She's buried in Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester, and she does have uh, a Pomeroy marker at her grave. Frederick Douglass was another one of those people. And here's the Tallman building where he had his North Star publication. Harriet Jacobs also kept an anti-slavery room here. The motto for Frederick Douglass's North Star was right is of no sex, truth is of no color. After the war, Douglass purchased this house uh, well, he, he lived in part and gave it to his daughter for a few years in Rochester. It's the only standing home related to Frederick Douglass that we know about in upstate New York. In South Butler in Wayne County, a very rural place today, is it gained fame as one of the very earliest dominant culture white churches to employ both an African-American, Samuel R. Ward, and a woman, Antoinette Brown, a women's rights activist and abolitionist as ministers. In New York City, the Equal Rights Association met in the post-Civil War period at Steinway Hall. And in 1869, there was a very acrimonious public meeting in which the American Equal Rights Association split over whether or not to support the 15th Amendment for voting rights for black men and organized the American Woman Suffrage Association and the National Woman Suffrage Association. The meeting in Saratoga Springs, a couple of months after that national meeting, organized the New York State Woman Suffrage Association at Congress Hall. Beginning in 1870, uh, suffragists started out on a roll, and then they ended up really being undercut by federal and Supreme Court uh, rulings. At the same time, women's roles expanded in this period in other areas. In terms of politics, many suffragists argued after passage of the 14th Amendment that women should have the right to vote because the 14th Amendment said that equal rights should extend to all persons born or naturalized in the United States. And suffragists said, well, the rights of citizens to vote is an equal right. So we find hundreds of women all over the, the country uh, trying to vote in the period after 1869. One of the most famous of those women was Susan B. Anthony, who voted in 1872 in Rochester and was tried here in June 1873 for voting she lost the case. The case then went to the Supreme Court and who turned it down and said that voting qualifications belong to the states, not to the federal government, and that women have no right to vote. It was one of the ways in which they were also limiting the right of black men to vote for the same reasons and the same argument. Um, having a bit of difficulty moving my computer here. Oh, there we go. In terms of work, women began to be active in a variety of fields. 
Cordelia Green in Castile, New York, organized a water cure and the, was very active in the Wyoming County Political Equality Club. Um, women doctors became uh, accepted. Dr. Mary Walker from Oswego, Dr. Sarah Logan from Syracuse um, were active in education. Women began to be admitted to colleges such as Alfred, as well as uh, St. Lawrence, Cornell, as co-educational institutions. In religion, women continued to play leadership roles. And here is the church, now the Caroline Valley Community Church in Tompkins County, where Annis Ford Eastman and Juanita Breckenridge Bates were both ordained as ministers. They were also both active suffragists. The Park Congregational Church in Elmira, New York, was where Reverend Annis Ford Eastman co-pastored with her husband, Samuel, and the Eastman's children, Crystal and Max, became suffrage leaders and socialists in New York City. Lilydale in Chautauqua County illustrates the close connection between the spiritualist movement and women's rights and lots of progressive causes. By 1890, grassroots networks began to be organized in a formal and extensive way across the country. Elizabeth Smith Miller was a key person, the daughter of Garrett and Ann Smith in Peterborough. She then moved to Geneva and her home, Lachlan, became a center of suffrage activism and all Carrie Chapman, Cat, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all major leaders met there. It's now a home since the 1930s for children. Elnora Babcock in Dunkirk, New York, is another one of the unsung heroines. She not only founded a political equality club, but she came, became the press secretary for New York State Women Suffrage Association and really helped publicize the movement. It was one of the reasons it was so successful. In New York City, women formed the Interurban Woman Suffrage Council in 1903 and met here. Black women in Brooklyn formed the Equal Suffrage League. And Sarah Smith Garnett, Verina Morton Jones, who was another early doctor, Mary Ito, and other African American suffragists met in what was then um, YMCA. At the same time that women began to work on wide Get widespread grassroots level for suffrage itself, they also began to make alliances with social workers. The social work profession emerged as a woman-dominated profession in this period. The Women's Educational and Industrial Union in Auburn is now was on the site of what is now the Equal Rights Center in Auburn. Sherwood became um, a nationally important small hamlet, so important for um, African-American rights, abolitionism, the Underground Railroad, women's rights, that the whole village is now in the National Register of Historic Places. Emily Holland, who you, whom you see with Susan B. Anthony, was a key national figure. And her niece, Isabel Howland, owned a home called Open Door, which is now one of the jewels of Sherwood. In 1894, people at these grassroots levels organized a petition campaign to urge the New York, New York State incorporate women's suffrage into its new constitution. Women got, um, and Isabel Howland worked with Mary Anthony, who's Susan B. Anthony's sister, they they collated and tied with wide yellow ribbons petitions that had over 300,000 names. They were taken down to the state legislature and unrolled in huge bundles and joined by another 300,000 name petitions from allies in labor unions and churches. Uh, Jean Brooks Greenleaf was then president of the New York State Woman Suffrage Association. And when the New York State Constitution did not include women's suffrage, if it were me, I think I would have said, I think I'll go home and rest. Jean Brooks Greenleaf said, no, reorganize your forces, call rallies, employ talent, men and women, send personal letters, start over right now again. And so they began uh, at, to continue their suffrage meetings statewide all across the state in the Presbyterian Church in Oswego, New York, held a meeting there in 1901. 
Memorial AME Zion Church became a center of women's suffrage, as well as a Black civil rights activism under Hester Jeffrey, who organized a Susan B. Anthony club there. Susan B. Anthony died at her home March 13, 1906, and her death marked the end of an era. The last public speech that she gave a month before her death was at Memorial AME Zion Church, and today, under Hester Jeffrey's um, fundraising, the church incorporates a stained glass window in Anthony's memory. It is the first public monument to Susan B. Anthony anywhere in the country. After Anthony's death, a younger generation of people began to take over and there was new energy and new tactics they began to explore. Susan B. or Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Bletch, was one of the organizers. In 1908, at the 60th anniversary of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, she brought the New York State Women's Suffrage Association back to Seneca Falls and reintroduced the demand for a woman's suffrage amendment at the national level. People all over the state took up the rallying cry. Ella Holly Crossett was president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. And she said in 1908, not since the Constitutional Convention in 1894 had so much work been reported. And they began recognizing the movement of population to New York City and of money. They began to move many of their organizing activities to New York City. They had a huge mass meeting in Carnegie Hall in 1908. They invited the radical British suffragist Emmeline Pankhurst to speak there in 1909. And Blatch formed a group called the Equality League of Self-Supporting -Support Women, which made a cross-class alliance between professional working women and working class women. One of the people who joined that movement was Rose Schneiderman who is a Polish-born Jewish suffragist, socialist, working-class advocate, and Women's Trade Union League member. She coined the phrase bread and roses that some of you may have heard, saying that we don't want either one or the other, we want them both. People of color also began to organize statewide and nationally for women's suffrage. The National Association of Colored People published the crisis un under um, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois here in New York City, and Du Bois published articles on women's rights and women's suffrage. Mrs. O.H.P. Belmont, one of the richest people in the country, paid for a whole floor on this building at, 40, at Fifth Avenue in the corner of 42nd Street, for headquarters of not only the New York State Women's Suffrage Association, but the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Suddenly there was money available for women's suffrage. Upstate, Harriet May Mills was the secretary of the, or president of the New York State Women's Suffrage Association in this period. And the woman's building at the New York State Fair is named after her today. Young women also joined the suffrage movement in large numbers. Ambassador Inez Milholland organized a meeting here in 1908. She invited Rose Schneiderman, Harriet Stanton Blatch, and others. The college said you cannot have a suffrage meeting on campus. It's too radical. So they held it in the cemetery next door. Meetings continued all over the state. The Shredded Wheat Biscuit Company hosted a meeting in Niagara Falls in 1910. And they began to use new tactics. Huge parades. One in 1912 attracted 10,000 people, including men, women, and children. The leader of the parade riding a horse was Mabel Pingwa Lee, a Chinese-American woman who could not vote because she was Chinese, um, but she was a Barnard student and became very active in promoting suffrage rights and women's rights. And she worked with the First Chinese Baptist Church for the rest of her life. In 1914, suffragists gathered in Rochester at the Jiva Theater and the Powers Hotel, and they determined they were going to make a major effort to get the New York State Legislature to pass women's suffrage again. In 
people at the convention were told after this convention closes, you're going to go stand on street corners and you're going to start speaking and you're going to get your uh, cars out if you have one and you're going to have an auto parade. You are not going to go home and just think about it. You're going to take action. One of the people who took some action was Edna, Edna Buck, Buckman Kearns with her daughter. Kearns was a writer for the Brooklyn Eagle, and she drove this suffrage wagon all over Long Island making suffrage speeches. They had a referendum statewide, 1915. 200,000 women were actively working. They held over 10,000 meetings. They printed over 7 million leaflets, almost 700,000 booklets, 150,000 posters, etc. They raised $115,000 at a mass meeting at Carnegie Hall, and they thought they had a good chance. They held a big suffrage parade, this time with 40,000 marchers. There seemed no end to the women who were determined to win the vote. They lost. 56.5% of New York State voters voted, male voters, of course, voted against woman suffrage. The disappointment was almost crushing. Again, did they go home and say, we'll just rest a while and think about it? No, they did not. Instead, they immediately reorganized. Two days after their defeat, they met in Cooper Union. They raised another $100,000. Juanita Breckenridge Bay said, suffrage has fallen, but it's fallen forward. And more than a million women in 1916, a majority of the women in New York State signed a women's suffrage petition. This time they succeeded in part because of strong support from New York City working class and Jewish neighborhoods. New York State finally passed an amendment recognizing women's suffrage November 6, 1917. Only one woman who had attended the Seneca Falls Convention was alive to vote. It was Rhoda Palmer, who was more than 100 years old, from Geneva, New York. New York State became the 14th state nationally to approve women's suffrage and the first state east of the Mississippi River. And they put their energies after 1917 toward a federal suffrage amendment. There were political partnerships like Ruth Mott and her husband, Luther Mott, Ruth worked with the New York State Women's Suffrage Association. Luther was a Republican congressman who urged congressional colleagues to vote. New York State women took part in the, as part of the first pickets of the White House as silent sentinels. And New York State's 45 congressional votes helped to win congressional approval for the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, August 26, 1920. For all the debate and conflict over that amendment, it is a very simple statement patterned after the 15th Amendment to the Constitution giving or recognizing the right of Black men to vote. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. But the story wasn't over. Couldn't restrict voting legally because of race or sex. So people thought of other ways to restrict voting rights in the South, especially for people of color. There were grandfather clauses. If your grandfather didn't vote, neither could you. Constitutional questions, poll taxes, and ultimately lynching. 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act finally granted citizenship to any indigenous person born within the US. That didn't mean they could vote. And many indigenous people said, we're, we, are, we are Onondaga people, we're not citizens of the U.S. It wasn't until 1952 with the McCarran-Walter Act that Asian citizens could not be excluded from voting because of their ethnicity. It also, in the early 20s, made people realize then these issues, especially of race and voting restrictions, had to be addressed separately from the issues of women. One of the women who did that was Mary Talbert. She had been president of the National Association of Colored Women from 1916 to 1920. 
And she became vice president of the NAACP in charge of their anti-lynching campaign in the early 1920s. She was a lifelong member and advocate for the Michigan Street Baptist Church in Buffalo. In 1923, Alice Paul took up the Declaration of Sentiments from 1848, and she said, you know, we've hardly had any of these implemented. I think what we need is more than voting rights. We need equal rights. And she wrote a very brief statement. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It became known as the Equal Rights Amendment. She introduced it first here at the Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls. The United States has yet to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. <clears throat> 1965, as the Civil Rights um, Movement gained a momentum, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It was one of the most far-reaching pieces of civil rights legislation we have ever had. And it allowed the federal government to intervene in cases where states were unlawfully restricting the right of people of color to vote. In 19, 2013, in the case of Selby v. Holder, the Supreme Court upheld gutting the Voting Rights Act and eliminating federal oversight of states that discriminated against voters of color. By 2021, 18 states had enacted laws making it harder for Americans to vote. So where do we go from here? Looking at historic sites in the unfinished revolution, I realized that at least I am interested in working on this and do work on this, not because it's the story is past, but because it's still very much alive and because the issue of voting rights is still one that we struggle with. And so I ask ourselves, what does it mean for us all to be citizens in a democracy? Look at the suffrage movement. It was persistent grassroots action. And to what extent do we um, learn from them or not? One of the ways we can do it in terms of our own education is to raise importance of voting rights through looking at historic sites that are all across the state in local communities everywhere. So if you're thinking about my, I might like to do something. One thing you can do is identify more sites and you can add them to the national database. You can nominate sites for historic markers. You can start talking about this idea of women's voting rights, of voting rights for all people, including um, people of color, indigenous people if they wish to vote, Asian people, Pacific Islanders. And we can begin to create a dialogue at a grassroots level ourselves. And of course, we can all, all vote. If you'd like further information, there are several books now out. One is a statewide one by Susan Goodyear and Karen Pastorello, Women Will Vote. And then several small other areas in countywide or regional ones have started to do some uh, research and publication on this well as well. And you and me, I think we are all a vibrant network of citizens, teachers, students, historians, museum people, historic preservationists. We can carry on this legacy all across the state from a grassroots level. And I thank you so much for being here and for carrying on the vision. Your task, should you choose to accept it, is to research, educate, and vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judith. Uh, great presentation, lots of information there. Um, I think we'll start with a question about um, your favorite historical sites. Which ones of these are your favorite to visit and why? Oh my goodness, that is a, that's <laughs> one of the toughest questions I've ever had. Um, oh my goodness, I, I can't choose, but I, I'm gonna give you three that I work with closely because they're so much fun. One is the Michigan Street Baptist Church in Buffalo, which is a di part of a dynamic um, African-American historic neighborhood. Another one is the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House because it stands for equal rights, not just for women, 
but for uh, African Americans, for indigenous people. And because we really try, and, and, and it's so much fun to build coalitions of people today that reflect those themes and movements and uh, populations. And then another one is uh, the whole village of Sherwood is well worth a visit for everyone. It's just like, I think of it as Brigadoon. If you blink your eyes when you're going through on 34B, you'll miss it. But if you stop, you will see an amazing collection of historic buildings relating to um, mostly Quakers and African Americans. Um, and there's, they're buried together in the cemetery, and the stories are fabulous. All of them are, of course, stories fabulous, but. Great, thank you. And if you want to unshare your screen, then we can just see you as you talk. Um, so the next question is is a more local question. Um, how, how would one go about finding stories of local community leaders um, and uh, others who might not have easily, we might not easily find in the records? How do you find those stories? Oh, that's a darn good question. And it relates to the fifth theme of the American Association of State and Local Histories commemorative 250th, Doing History. We are so blessed now to be able to have online newspapers that we never had access in terms of this number before. And they're quite easy to search. They're newspaper archives, newspapers.com, genealogy bank, uh, fultonhistory.com. A, a lot of the people in the audience today probably know these, but they're, and, um, they're accessible, and accessible archives through the New York State Museum or New York State Library also has um, 19th century materials that are focused on African-American and women's and other things. So it's actually quite easy even for students in schools to be able to get online, put in something like whatever community you live in. I live in Fulton, Fulton suffrage and see what comes up and you'll find names. And then you can begin to research the names in the census and the local histories. And Great. Um, and then also thinking about you were trying to tie, you were tying it at the end there to our, our modern voting rights issues and, and grassroots efforts. And, you know, a lot of times students will say, well, that was, you know, the 19th century, this is today, it, you know, and what would you say to how, how the, it might be similar or different and, and what we can learn from the women's suffrage movement and how we handle and, and advocate for better voting rights for everyone today? You know, I think part of it is questions I can't answer, but are worth all of us thinking about and asking. Why was it so hard for people to accept that simple uh, 19th Amendment, the right to vote shall not be restricted by the United States or any state on, a, on the basis of sex? What's so difficult about that? And I think I have the same question now. Why? In, I didn't look about 2023, but 2021, there were 18 states that were trying to restrict voting rights. Why? It is so essential to a democracy that each citizen has the right to vote. Why is there such an attack today on that basic democratic right? And then I think what I get as a lesson from the suffrage movement, which just still amazes me, is how well organized people were at a local level and how important the local participation and activism was in passing the national amendment. And it's that tension in, between local and state and federal action that made it possible. And I ask myself, is that what we should be thinking about today in terms of voting rights for all of us? How do we best handle our current situation? Uh, and then we did have a comment here um, about uh, the federal and New York State uh, equal rights amendments um, that have yet to be passed. Um, and that those are, so there's still a threat to women's rights um, without those. Um, do you have a, any comment or, or um, on, on, well, on that again. question? You know, we haven't even endorsed the um, UN resolutions on women's rights. And I'm thinking, I just, I guess I don't understand it. It seems so simple to me and so obvious. I do not understand why people would oppose it. 
So okay. I'm not the person to ask. I'd love to know the answer to your question. Um, but you had mentioned the grassroots movement and local communities. Do you think that's still relevant today? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we're so torn apart as a country that I, one of my goals is just to talk to my neighbors. And we don't have to agree politically. We just have to be kind to each other and try to find some common ground if it's there. And if we don't agree, we can agree to disagree. But we have to recognize our common humanity, our our common concerns as not only Americans, but as citizens of this world. And that um, somehow we need to move forward. And the only way to do it is do it together. I think that is a great way <laughs> uh, to wrap up. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, this will be available for recording uh, after the fact. Um, and hold on one second here. I think make sure there's no more questions. Okay, yeah, we're good. Um, and this will be available for recording uh, after, uh, I would say within a week or so, you'll get a link um, uh, to be able to watch it. Um, and we thank you very much. This was thank you so very much, Jordan. And I think very needed uh, at this time. So I think uh, lots of great information and uh, check out the local historical markers. Yes, yeah, do. For thank sure. you. Thank you all so much for being here. And thank you for being here too, Jordan. Appreciate sure. it. Thank you.